And as Sam was going to be teaching us tonight, Pastor Lambo will be teaching us the book of James tonight. That time, Pastor Lambo, we are going to lift his spirit. The moment, the God will give him the strength, the God will give him the power, the God will give him the wisdom as he take over the Bible teaching, as he bring it all tonight for the children of God. We are going to be a God who will give the utterance that every woman that yes. comes out from here is yes. the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that the yes. Holy Spirit. We are going to pray that God will lift him up tonight. God will speak for him tonight. We are going to pray that God will use him tonight. God will give him his life tonight. Let us pray. Let us pray for the teacher tonight. Let us pray for that's not Pastor Lambo tonight, but he's going to be teaching us tonight. Father mm -hmm. Almighty God, we thank you for tonight. Nice. Thank oh, you for this great opportunity that we are able to meet tonight to do the Bible study. It's not only we are meeting tonight, but also we are praying for the teacher who's coming to conduct the teaching tonight. Pastor Lambo will pray for him tonight. We lift Pastor Lambo in the city of truth. We lift this life onto your throne, my Lord, my God. And it's not by his power, it's not by his might, it's not by his wisdom. No, it's about you. Come tonight. Oh, you have the power. No, you have the strength. You have the wisdom. And Lord, we pray that you give him that power tonight. You give him that strength tonight. That you be able to deliver the message for your children. That you be able to lead your children to your Bible study tonight. That everybody will enjoy the Bible study. Everybody will open up. And listen, everybody will come to that open house, to that open mind, to listen to the Bible study, to participate in the Bible study, to contribute to the Bible study, my Lord, my God. And it's not about what power, because we don't have the power. As long as we don't have the power, we don't even have the strength. So Lord, we ask that you give him the strength tonight. You give him the power tonight. You give him the wisdom tonight. Direct him. Direct him according to your power. Direct him according to my Lord, my God. It's nothing about him. It's nothing about him. But it's all about you. It's all about your kingdom. It's yes. about your kingdom. It's about your strength, my Lord, my God. Yes. We thank you for tonight. We thank you for what you are about to do in this Bible study. Jehovah, take us so control. Lead him. We thank you for tonight. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray tonight. Amen. 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 My Lord, my God, we thank you for tonight. What a great opportunity you have given to us to meet and discuss about your kingdom through this Bible study from the book of James. My Lord, my God. Father, we thank you. We thank you that every time that we come to you and we turn everything to you, you hear our prayer. You listen to our prayer. We thank you. This Bible study is to deepen our faith, is to enlighten us, is to allow us to accelerate, to keep on going no matter what we face. For that reason, Lord, I pray tonight that you open our heart, you open our brains, you open our body so we can absorb everything that we study, everything that we hear, everything that we hear tonight, my Lord, my God. Father, we thank you for those on your way coming to their various homes. To begin the Bible study, Lord, I pray that you bring the Holy Spirit. And for those who are waiting in the line, Lord, I pray that you give them an understanding that will be able to finish it by this Bible study with so much joy and so much excitement. We thank you. We bless your holy name. We bless your holy name. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray tonight. Amen. 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 Good evening, everyone. Pastor Lambo, Apostle of Jesus. Thank you so much. Good evening, Elder uh, Obeng. Good evening, Saints of Man Zion for Leadership Church. Um, tonight, uh, I'll be standing in for our General Basia because of his uh, busy schedule after returning back from the successful mission trip. So we thank God for his life. Um, we, we thank God for uh, Man Zion for Leadership Church, especially uh, those people that have been helping us with um, the Bible study. And uh, we thank uh, Elder Seth 
to have um, started the games for us. So tonight, it's another very, very interesting um, discussion we're going to have, and, and, that, and that is coming from um, uh, James chapter 1, verses 13 to 18. In, in that, uh, I'll just read and then we'll start developing it. He said, in, in verse 12, he said, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Then he went on in verse 13. He said, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variations or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruit of his creatures. Now, Starting from that verse 13, he said, No one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. Because God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Now, we are, we are here taught this evening that God is not the author of any man's sin. He is not the originator of any man's sin. Whoever they are who raise persecutions against men or whatever injustice and sin they may be guilty of in proceeding against them, God is not to be charged with it. And whatever sins good men may themselves be provoked to by their own excesses, and afflictions, God is not the cause of them. It seems to be there, suppose that some professors might fail in the hour of temptation, that the rod resting upon them might carry some into ill causes and make them put forth their hands unto iniquity. Now, what do we have here? What do we have in the world today? And uncountable cases of injustices in the world, and especially among the law enforcement agents, politicians, the religious fanatics that are killing people in the name of religion, are they fighting for God? These are the problems that are facing people today. People just because they are not of the same races as we are, injustice in our courts, and the engagement of false witnesses resulting in many innocent people wasting away in jailhouses? I often ask myself this question. Do these types of people suffer any consequences of their iniquities since some get scot free under the law? We are seeing cases of the police brutality, killing people innocently, unarmed people. And the law protects them. They say they, they, were, they, they, they were threatened. Or something happened and, and they get caught free. Then I, I ask myself, even though God says that vengeance is mine, but when is the vengeance, when, when, is, the, when, when is the case going to be redressed? So I ask myself, do they get away with it at all? Um, you know, because this should be the case. And 
though delinquents should attempt to lay their fault on God, so some of them they blame God that well, it, 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 it's uh, God's will. Yet the blame of their misconduct must lie entirely upon themselves. Is there any law of retributive justice which we often call the law of karma? If truly there's a law of karma, I want us tonight to consider the following points. One, there is nothing in the nature of God that they can lay the blame upon. There is nothing in the nature of God because Jesus Christ did not commit any sin. And Jesus Christ is the Son of God. A carbon copy of God. He committed no sin. So, so there is no sin with God. And that's what is the author is saying that let no man say when he is tempted to take any evil cause or do any evil thing. I am not tempted of God for God cannot be tempted with evil. All moral evil is owing to some disorder in the being that is chargeable with it. To a want of wisdom, either a want of wisdom, because because the popular go, uh, 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 saying used to go that um, it is wisdom that will take that to save you from getting into trouble, but it takes miracle to get you out of trouble. So so want of wisdom can lead us into committing sin, or power or decorum or purity in the will. So don't we have example like this in the Bible today? Let us take one example for example. Cain, he killed Abel because of envy. But when he was committing the sin, he did, he, he, he did not even think of the consequences. But envy is one of the causes. He killed Abel because of envy. And then what about King David? King David had everything. But he killed Uriah. And why? Because of Bathsheba. And Jesus, and Jesus is carried also. He betrayed Jesus Christ because of greed. He never thought when he was when he was negotiating with Caiaphas uh, or Ananias, he, he never thought that Jesus Christ was going to surrender. He thought maybe he uh, 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 would disappear or use his spiritual power. But it was too late for him to repent because Jesus Christ surrendered himself completely. And he committed suicide. That, that was death. That is the wages of sin is death. And but what about our own father Adam? He disobeyed God and listened to his wife Eve. To forfeit the grace of Eden. Because what do we have in the Garden of Eden? Eternal life. Not to suffer anyone, not to suffer anything. But we forfeited that one through our own father, Adam. So in our own various personal experiences, we also, we have story to tell. We have committed so many things when we were young. But was Satan the one who was responsible? Certainly not. God, although we said in the last verses that sometimes trials will come and we must endure tribulations and trial with the full knowledge of God. So where do we differentiate that tribulation from consequences of our own deliberate sin? When do we know? So, but who can impeach the Holy God with the want of these which are his very essence? No exigency of affairs can ever tempt him to dishonor or to deny him, and therefore he cannot be tempted with evil. Now, there is something in the providential dispensation of God that the blame of any man's sin can be laid upon. 
as we read in verse 13, neither tempted he any man. God does not tempt anyone. As God cannot be tempted with evil himself, so neither can he be a tempter of other people. He cannot be a promoter of what is repugnant to his nature. So the carnal mind is willing to charge its own sins on God. We blame either God or we blame Satan. Now, there is something hereditary in this. Something very, very hereditary. In, in other words, all human beings, we all carry the same genes. And along the generations upon generations, we, we have the, uh, this, this hereditary characteristics in which we follow the footsteps of our great, great, great father, grandfathers, the, the patriarchs. And our first father, Adam, tells God, but the woman, thou givest to me, tempted me. So thereby, in effect, throwing the blame upon God for giving him the tempter. Let no man speak thus. It is very bad to sin, but it's much worse when we have done a miss to charge it upon God and say it was owing to God. Those who lay the blame of their sins either upon their constitution or upon their condition in the world, or who pretend that they are under a fatal necessity of sinning, they wrong God as if he were the author of sin. Why did you steal? Because of poverty. Because I haven't eaten since morning. Why did you do this, this one? You have to blame something instead of accepting. And nobody has ever, ever, ever been able to be bold enough to accept responsibility for his sin. You have to blame it on something. You blame it on the government. You blame it on your parents. You blame it on your pastor. You blame it on the society. And that is what we do all the time. And afflictions are sent by God are designed to draw out our graces, but not our corruption. Afflictions are sent by God are designed to draw out our graces, but not our constitution. God is not going to tempt us to go and steal to, to, so, so that he, he can test us, our trial. No. So, so we should be able to, to differentiate between the trials that we, are for, we have been discussing in the previous verses and the consequences of our action that the tribulation we cause ourselves. Now we are taught we are the true cause of evil lies. And where the blame ought to be. In verse 14, it says, Every man is tempted. In an ill sense, when he is drawn away from his own lust and enticed, when he is drawn away due to his own lust and enticed. In other scriptures, the devil is called the tempter. And other things may sometimes concur to tempt us, but neither the devil nor any other person or thing is to be blamed so as to excuse ourselves. For the true original of evil and temptation is in our own heart. The combustible matter is in us, though the flame may be blown up by some outward causes, though the flame may be blown up by some outward causes. And what, what are we seeing there? Now, there are some churches in which you have you, 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 we, 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 we used to call them these spiritual girls, especially in those big churches. They are all there just to destroy the, the, the pastor, to, to destroy the church. And you see that the way they dress, the way they go about. And if a pastor or any leader or any elder in the church is not spiritually strong enough, they will entice him. They carry him away. 
Now, do we blame Satan for that? Because this, because one thing, one thing is, is we, because we have just read that we must not blame Satan or God for anything. But Satan can still use some people to derail us. And then whom do we blame? Do we blame that person or blame ourselves or blame Satan? So these are the things we're going to consider tonight. Where do we draw the line? You see, the compostable matter is in us. We. Because, because one thing, it, 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 it's a kind of a combustion. The water is there. And it's boiling. And it's boiling and it's boiling. And it's going to burst. What are we going to do? So though the flame may be blown up by some outward causes, and therefore if thou scornest, thou alone shall bear it, as we read in Proverbs 2, uh, Proverbs 9 verse 2, that if you scornest, you alone will bear the consequences. Now, what do we find? Let us consider some things here. One, the method of sin is in its proceeding the method of sin it takes stages it's, it, it's a procedure you go from one stage to another stage to another stage to another stage now the first stage it draws away then the second stage it entices as holiness consists of two parts forsaking to that which is evil and cleaving to that which is good so these two things reverse are the same parts of sin. The heart is carried from that which is good and enticed to cleave to that which is evil. It is faced by corrupt inclinations or by lusting after and converting some sensual or worldly things. The eyes will be the first to see it. The eyes transmit it to the heart. If the heart lost after it, it sends it to the brain. And the brain now starts calculating what can we do? What, what can I do to get it? What can I do to have it? What can I do to steal it? What can I do to possess it? And the brain is this, and the brain is working, and the heart is working. But the eyes has to see first. And that's why the Lord said, if your eyes causes you to sin, he said, pluck it out. It is better for you to go disabled to heaven than to than all your or the body of your past to go to hell. So so the heart is carried from that which is good and enticed to cleave to that which is evil. So it is first by corrupt inclination or by lusting after and converting some sexual or worldly thing and strangled from the life of God, taken away from the life of God. And then by degrees fixed in a cause of sin. Now, coming back again to King David again. He was while in the way time, as all the kings do on the back on the balcony. When suddenly he saw one beautiful woman bathing in, in, in her own balcony, maybe some, some kilometers away. And his eyes continued to fix on her. She was a beautiful woman. He couldn't take his eyes from her. He called one of his servants. Who is that woman? They said, That is Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. So what? He said they should invite her. So they invited her. And at that time, the Israel was at war. So Uriah was one of the army captains of King David. He was at the war front. As soon as he saw Uriah, loss came into his heart. He couldn't control himself anymore. And and you see, situation is not even different for many, many uh, people of God today. From many, many men today. It's a common sin. 
So, so, so nobody, nobody, nobody is, is pure enough to point accusing finger at anybody. Anybody can be tempted at any time. So the loss in him took over. And we all know the story. Are this not what we have brought many Christian churches into chaos today? Many churches have gone down. Many churches have broken down. Many churches have divided into pieces simply because of this kind of problems. Chaos in the church. And how many churches today are filled with Jezebel dressing to church to tempt the pastors and men in the church. And these are the major problems confronting the churches today and why many pastors have to carry their wives when visiting houses of women members and not restricted to or married alone. Now, the question I want to ask is... Um, has any of these pastors, if, 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 if you have any pastor online tonight, or elder online tonight, have anyone have so, so, sort of experienced this kind of uh, temptation before, or heard about it before? Can you, share, can you share that experience you have had before with us? Why are pastors so afraid to, 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 uh, uh, to, to have a, a consultation with, with uh, uh, female members in a lock, locked up room. Because I notice in our own church, we have a kind of um, a, 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 a people you can always see our pastors with anybody. But in some churches, uh, the door is locked. But what is the danger in it? Can somebody answer me that question? Pastor Paul? Hello, Ben. Ah, good sir. Yeah. I I notice in Manzai on fellowship church we, we have a, a kind of a a, a a pee hole that anybody can see what is going on inside. But in some churches it is not there. But I, I used to wonder why.
them, you want, you know, somebody there with you, either your another leader or your spouse to be there with you in terms of counseling as well. So again, you know, you want to take all the necessary precautions, you know, in order for you to not to fall into 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 that temptation. And I think that's one of the things because the temptation doesn't come from God. Yeah. But God allows them. You know, God although God allows them, you know, but he himself would not it's not going to entice us, you know, to evil. So God may test our faith without any solicitation to evil, because He, he you know, because God Himself will not tempt anybody. Mm-hmm. So you don't want to find yourself in a situation where you know you are tempted or something happens and you cannot defend yourself. That's and right. that's why we, I, for me, I leave that little bit there so somebody can. And I, that's why I like to be where I be, so you can see me as you pass by. That's right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now, we may observe hence the power and the policy of sin. The word here rendered drawn away, as we read in that verse 13, signifies a being forcibly hailed or compelled. The word translated entice signifies being willed or beguiled by allotment and deceitful representation of things. There's a great deal of violence done to conscience and to the mind by the power of corruption. And there's a great deal too of cunning and deceit and flattery in sin to gain us to its interest. So, so it, 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 it's not an easy, it, it, it's not a, a kind of a, a force that we can take for granted. We have to fight, we have to wrestle with it. Because it's very cunning and very deceitful and very flattery too. And the force and power of sin could never prevail were it not for its cunning and guile. The force and power of sin could never prevail were it not for its cunning and guile. And was that not what Peter asked Ananias in Acts of Apostle 5? Ananias, he said, why did you let Satan fill you with the idea that you could deceive the Holy Spirit? It was not an impossible decision. He must have sat down with his wife and reasoned with her and, and concluded with her and connect with her. So it was not spontaneous at all. So, and that's why Peter said, why do you let Satan fill you with idea that could deceive the Holy Spirit? Now, now, are we not contradicting ourselves here? Because Peter now is now saying, it was Satan that filled you. You've held back some of the money you received for the land. But while you had the land, it was your own. After it was sold, you could have done as you pleased with the money. So how could you do a thing like this? You didn't lie to people, but to God. But was Satan to blame? Because I'm still, I'm still to find an answer to that one. Is it because sinners who perish are weird and flattered to their own destruction? And this will justify God forever in their damnation. Because God knew that it was not spontaneous. God knew that it was not something that was innocently done on awareness or ignorantly done. But it was having conceived, it was it was conceived by the heart. It was it they decided not to plan it. So as soon as God had every 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 cause to, uh, to, to judge. You see, they are seen lies at their own door, and therefore their blood will lie upon their own head. You see, so now the, the success of corruption in the heart in that verse 15. Then, when lost as conceived, when lost. So, so it's bringing us into, into, into a, 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 a simile now. He said, when lost as conceived. It brings forth sin. 
that is sin being allowed to excite desires in us, that is sin being allowed to, 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 to mature, to germinate in us, it will soon ripen those desires into consent, and then it is said to have conceived. And the sin truly exists, though it be but in embryo, that is, an embryo, you see, it has already left the stage of an egg, so it is now an embryo. It's already fertilized, and it's going to start feeding and growing like a baby inside the womb. And when it has grown its full size in the mind, it is then brought forth in actual execution. So, so it's bringing us the stages in which sin is committed. So it is, it is, it is it, in the first case, just like an ovum, just like an egg. But when it is fertilized, there's no turning back. It starts it start growing, it starts growing, it starts growing. Then it is then brought forth in actual execution. Now, it is not possible to act on impulse to commit a sin without the conscience. And what is that conscience, that silent, unseen guidance in our heart? Asking us the rationality of what we are about to do. So many questions he asks, and yet many at times we fall or we fail to listen to that voice of conscience and why. So now the sub beginnings of sin, therefore, or else all evil is it produces must be wholly charged upon us. That the question we want to ask ourselves tonight now is what exactly is conscience? Is it a spirit indwelling in every human being? And does it exist in every human being? And if it does, why do we often do not listen to it? How can we listen and obey our conscience if it exists so that we will not fall into temptation? That is the question I'm, I'm asking tonight. What is conscience? The first, the, the first part of it is what is conscience? Is it a spirit indwelling in every human being? Can somebody answer that one, please? Yes, sir. There are two components there. Okay. So does it exist in every human being? It exists in every human being. Okay, if you are depressed, if you're not bothered, if you are depressed, if you're not bothered, 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 my conscience, you know, it bothers you. You go to bed, it plays on your mind. So it is something everybody has. It is, you know, if you're very depraved, crazy mad, then then that's the whole different thing as a mental problem there. But that's what conscience means. It's two words, they are gone and sense, which means 
knowledge. For knowledge. Now, now this this if you can get a satisfactory answer to this one, it will help a lot of people. And that is how can we listen and obey our conscience so that we will not fall into temptation. Now, um, the, 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 I've got to answer that one later on, but, but if you can get an answer, it will be so nice that how can we listen and obey our conscience so that we will not fall into temptation. Now, the final issue of sin and how it ends. Sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. And after sin is brought forth in actual commission, the finishing of it, as, as Dr. Wanton observed, is its being straightened by frequent acts and settled into a habit. And once, like I've said, a sin is committed, if somebody gets away with it, If, if that person is not very careful, it becomes a habit. And I think that was what Apostle Paul was also referring, that can we continue to sin so that, so that grace may abound? He said, no. Because we sin every day, but what can I sin? And that was what makes the, 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 the life of David different from our own life. Because people were asking, but David also committed sin where was he now? A man after God's own heart. But some people say that David sin, that David did not commit one sin uh, uh, two times or three times. Unlike we will commit sin every day and we pray to God to forgive us and God continue to forgive us. But for our Lord, we God continue to forgive us until that sin becomes a habit. And that was what we are, we are, we are asking ourselves tonight. So that when, when iniquities of men are thus filled up, death is brought forth. There is a death upon the soul, and death comes upon the body. And besides death, spiritual and temporal, the wages of sin is eternal death too. So let sin therefore be repented of and forsaken before it finishes us. Why will you die? O house of Israel, as we read in Ezekiel 33, 11. God has no pleasure in your death as he has no hand in your sin. But both sin and misery are owing to ourselves. Your own heart loss and corruption are your tempters. The loss of your heart and corruption are your own tempters, not Satan. And when by degree they have carried you off from God and finished the power and dominion of sin in you. Then they will prove your destroyers. They really want to destroy you. We can all see ourselves in the life history of the children of Israel. All of us tonight, we can see ourselves in the life history of the children of Israel. Despite the great miracle of deliverance from the hand of King Pharaoh, walking on dry ground, in the middle of the Red Sea, they still rebelled against God, who delivered them and forced Aaron to give them a golden calf as their God. The consequences, many of them perished. And this brings us to our second question tonight. Then, <coughs> our question then is how can all of us save ourselves? from paying the wages of sin, which is death. When temptation comes, it doesn't respect and recognize anyone, be ye pastor, be ye elder, be ye deacon or deaconess or choir master. And these are the sets of office holders that have suffered temptations in the ministries, in the ministries, especially in large churches. And what are the distractions in the church that can lure the minds of members into several desires, mode of dress, type of rights, and freedom of individuals in the church and what? So what? 
can save ourselves. How can we save ourselves? From paying the wages of sin, which is dead. When temptation comes, it doesn't respect anybody. How can we save ourselves? Through prayer. Amen. Because again, I'll, I'll go back to Matthew. You know, I know we pray the Lord's Prayer all the time. You know, um, you know, the our you know, the, the, um, the Lord's Prayer. And we say that all the time. And I go back to that subject because I think that's the verse of the Lord of, in fact, that verse, you know, has been omitted by a lot of other, you know, um, you know, our writers because they say, they say, well, God will not lead you into temptation. But that's not what it's saying. What it's saying is a prayer mm -hmm. that God do not permit us to be overcome by evil, but deliver us from the evil one. That's what that prayer means. So if you are praying that prayer, then you're asking God, you know, not to, not to permit us to be overcome by the evil one. But again, and, and it, but there it talks about, you know, and lead us not into temptation. God will not lead you into temptation. That's not what that prayer is. And that's why a lot of people misunderstand that, that, that prayer. But really that prayer is asking God to not permit us to be overcome by evil. So our prayer is for God not to permit us to be overcome by evil. All right? And then if you go to Matthew 7, 17, or Matthew 7, 7, what it is saying there, yeah, it says, you know, if we knock, all right, mm. it says, ask and it shall be given, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be open unto you. For every man, for every, for everyone that asks, receive it, and he that seeks, find it. And to him that knocketh, it, it shall be open. So really, if you are, if you are praying that prayer in Matthew 6 13, and then you go to uh, Matthew 7 7, then what you're asking, you're, you're asking God, you know, not to allow you to be overcome by the evil one, all right? And you're not, not, definitely knocking on that door for God to deliver you from the evil one. And I think those prayers are going to help you, you know. And don't make yourself available to, the, you know, don't, don't, don't make yourself available to sin. You know, so again, it goes back to, you know, prayer. It goes back to renew our mind. It goes back to being in the world all the time. Because that's the only way we're going to renew our mind. Where we're going to strengthen that so we're going to be spiritually strong because sin is right under our nose. That's true. It's right under our nose. Yes. So we now have to equip ourselves, you know, as believers, in order not to allow this one to, you know, God to come into the sin. And that's also go for anything that can distract us in the church, in the mode of dress and all, and the behavior. And, um, because um, we, we, we cannot say it's uh, the, the free society or, or to what extent can, can, can exercise of freedom of rights exist in the church? Immorality is not permitted. It's not permitted, definitely. And what is immorality? In dress? Can somebody come in a mini dress? Or dress carelessly, yeah. So which 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 means that must be decorum, isn't it? That must be. And that brings us to these following verses in sixteen and seventeen. He said, "I, I think he said, do not be deceived." My, yes, sir. Yeah. Um, you know, when we talk about uh, immorality, and um, you, you, uh, I think you gave an example of someone coming to church dressed uh, inappropriately. That's right. Um, in your opinion, or anyone can ask and that, um, how would you address a situation like that? Beautiful. Uh, I think that is where the, the uh, code of conduct. Uh, or the bylaws of the church comes in because uh, it, 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 even though we are living in a permissive society, but every every churches or every church they, they have their own uh, uh, code of conduct, and they want the standard they want to build. Some some are permissive, and some are 
uh, like uh, uh, the general verse I've said now, um, we must not compromise. So now, so so now, where do we now draw your your um, moral code? Because there are some churches they don't wear earrings, they don't wear jewels, they don't wear this thing because according to them it is immoral, which is wrong. I don't, I don't, I don't subscribe to that. And there are some churches also they insist that you you, you must wear uh, your garment must must must, must uh, cover your nail. So we are do we draw the line? And uh, who is competent to judge anybody's morality? Some people don't consider dressing up with all the chest open as a sin. Is according to them is fashion. But can they wear that? Can they wear the, the dresses they wear to clubhouses to church? Can they wear tight fit that expose? I mean that, that, that shows all the 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 contour of the bots and all these things uh, these are these are uh, these are distractions not many men can take their eyes off not many men are strong enough without feet they can lure people's hearts and that's what we are now saying that sin does not just come spontaneously it sends a message to the brain to, to the eyes and then the eyes send the message to the brain and then then the, the next thing is the the, the 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 heart is in trouble and and before you know it, the embryo is already developing in stages. So where does the pastor come in here to do his job? Is it the job of the, the, the ushers or the pastor or the, the, the church management to lay down their regulation? This is what we want in our own church. So I don't have any, I don't have any right answer to that, uh, Edda Kabu. Yes, sir. I think if I understand Dr. Mankabu's question, how do we deal with that? I mean, that can be dealt with immediately. See? Because I remember in Mount Zion Fellowship Church, before we moved to the sanctuary where we are now, there was a dead lady who walked in, you know, and I will mention her name. But she sat right in front, you know, in the front row, and she crossed her leg, and she had a defect that was split. She had a split. So, of course, you know, the way she sat, you you know, she was exposed. But there was a lady there who was brave enough to take it, you know, there was there was a wrap, you know, and she took it and came and literally was in the front row. She was in the choir sort of but the choir was on the pulpit, you know, where you know, with the with the you know, on the pulpit. She saw that, she got up, took a wrap, came and covered this lady publicly. We all saw that and I saw that lady was very embarrassed. All right, she didn't wait. And again, this is where the women in the church or the older women in the church can also talk to the young people and the issues. But if somebody comes down and sitting in the front row and the pastor or the elders are teaching, then somebody should address and say, look, please, you know, can, you know, you know, if you think that person should be addressed there and then. That's right. Or they cover the person and embarrass the person. So that's what you do. You get embarrassed just like, you know, this lady did it. So the lady was in the front row. So that can be, you can just leave you, you can just leave yeah, and the pastor, the teacher is teaching, and he's been distracted. You know, you've been distracted. You know, so that can be dealt with, and maybe that person can then uh, talk to that person one on one. I mean, it's not we don't really have that issue so much in our fellowship church, but you know, that's that's something that can be dealt with immediately, and then the person can be spoken to later. You know, but yes, of course, if you are coming to church and you're a believer. You know that when you come to this, you dress appropriately, you know, for church. That's you're not right. going to a nightclub, you come to the house of God. There should be some reverence in the house of God. That's right. You know, but some something we have to address it here, we cannot wait. That's right. Thank you, sir. Edakagbo, are you satisfied? That's right. Um, of course, the problem there now is um, in, in the example that um, Osmana gave someone from the choir, a woman came and you know, um, covered a lady that was sitting there. Um, 
and, and you know, they come in different um, fashion. Um, you know, so the church as a whole, or at least the leadership of the church, at least, uh, need to understand what the, uh, the code of ethics of the church is for you to be able to address those situations. Otherwise, people tend to, uh, you know, fall into their own um, comfort zone or don't want to antagonize someone or don't want to say something to someone that will make them feel as if um, they are uncomfortable because usually that's what happens. That's right. But if there is a, a clear line, a clear direction as to how these issues can be addressed, I think um, it aids the process uh, for someone to walk up to someone and ha have a conversation if that's the way um, it has been encouraged for the church to handle it, or someone passed the word on to um, you know, a relevant person who can maybe, you know, if in a situation like the woman, maybe a male saw something like that and um, feels like it's not inappropriate, they could talk to the leadership, I mean, the, the women's um, leaders, you know, to see if they could address it. Mm -hmm. In a case that, um, you know, that's not addressed, then I think so. I just think that, that there has to be some kind of uh, education of um, the leadership to know how these things should be addressed. Yes, I think and I, I yeah, yeah, Karen, sir. It's usually with the guests as well. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, not so much members of the church, because none of them are school. But most of the time, it's work out guests, you know. And in my own experience, you know, as a pastor, not, not really members of the church, but mainly guests, you know. Members of the church is easy. If you do that, I personally run, I'll call my wife and I'll ask, can you, you know, I, I've done that before. I've done both. Okay, that's fine. In Mount Zion. Mm -hmm. You know, I would do it. I'm, I don't even have to wait because by the time, even if, if you do have a policy, it's too late because you have to be exposing yourself. We just say we'll be around. And because we don't want too much, you know, you, you know you're going to distract somebody, you know. But, um, I mean, this happened in Sierra Leone, you know, because this person, she's not a guest in that. She's not a, a, a I wouldn't say she's a guest as such, but she, and she's been in church for some time, all right? And this person was actually in Mount Zion Fellowship Church here, and went to, to the church in Freetown, and she was a shop here of the thousand, a shop. And nobody here saw the church. And they asked her to go and change. That's right. So really, you know, those things have to be kept immediately, you know, and I mean, I, I personally don't have any excuse on it, actually, because from one of the portions of the table, can we take us to the back seat, let us sit at the back, you know, I, I don't have any issue with doing that, because that has to be kept immediately, you know, and especially if they are guests, we we'll find a way to just call them and say, look, you know, find a way of letting them know, but you can't. So now, <coughs> now let me just, just yeah. ask before, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Lambo. Yeah. I just want to uh, clarify. Um, so, uh, as a church, um, because I'm not so sure, uh, 
that we, we have actually set up specific rules that govern our code of dressing. I don't know if that's something that um, we have um, tried to lay out. Um, I, I think, um, yeah, I, I think that that was an incident. Why, why, yeah, um, you know, okay, okay. So, what do you mean? Okay, okay, so let's say, for example, so just to um, give examples here, um, for instance, you cited an example when someone where someone wear a short, you know, pants, um, to eat in the sanctuary on a service. Um, that's, that's of course, you know, you would expect that someone who's been a Christian for a while, you know, to, to know that that is inappropriate, right? But there are other subtle ways that people dress that is, uh, can be subject to, uh, um, you know, uh, someone's uh, impression about that kind of dress. Uh, give example, someone who wear uh, like a female, a female, female wear tight pants that is exposing uh, you know, a figure and is in front of the church. Um, let's say, for example, uh, part of the choir standing there singing. And um, how can that be interpreted based on you know the same um, standards that we're talking about? Or someone wearing a um, a blouse that exposes part of you know black images, you know, um, how can that how do we you know interpret that? How do we respond to, to that? Or how does that um, relate to the um, the expectations that the church has set? Very interesting question that's yeah, I mean, the reason why I was, I was asking that question, you know, talking about code of conduct, just like, you know, we, because there, there is just a fine line, because one of our, you know, that I just know is pastor. She doesn't even want anybody, anyone, anyone female to wear earrings to the church. She doesn't want anybody to put on the makeup to the church, all right? She doesn't, and because of that, once leaving the church, she's come and cooking, all right? And that's part of the code of conduct. Because the holiness people, they have their own code of color. You don't wear trousers, you don't wear earrings, you don't wear makeup, you don't wear this. And that's their own code of conduct. Okay? And that's what I was asking the question because, again, there, there are certain areas you can impose on people and you can drive them away. If somebody walks in for the first time in the church, you know, this person is a complete guest, we don't know them at all. Even if people have a code of conduct, they don't have a code of conduct. But then we have to do something. It's how we do it that matters. You know, so that's why it's good to have older women in the church. But most of these things apply to women. You know, that's why it's good to have older women in the church, which will call them aside and talk to them and say, look, you know what? Thank you for coming, but we, we don't know about this. But in this church, you know, we don't, you know, da 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 da. And this is how we do it. You know, explain it to them. And that, that can be done that way. But in, in that particular case, I cited, I mean, that was so bad that the church had to do something immediately. But again, with the holiness, you know, church, they have their own code of conduct. No earrings, no makeup, no this, no that, no this, no that. But again, we, we don't go down that line because we, you know, women wear earrings, we get put on makeup. Again, other people will say, well, you know, the holiness will look at us and say, look, you guys, your code of conduct is wrong because you shouldn't allow people to wear makeup and earrings to come to church. Again, there is a balance there, you know, and that's. With what is happening in Kamapu, and I'm just waiting for her, she said I should give her a month or so because she just got married, but only wants to be over. I'm going to address that issue. You know, because you can't try to away from church because they put on the makeup or they come with earrings. No, you can let them come with their earrings, let them come with their makeup. Now, if somebody comes to the church with a short cast and exposing herself, that's a different thing altogether. That's right. You know, we can address that. You know, so even if we do have a policy, we have to be very careful that we have our. our, our Dress code that does not drive people away from the church, which is what is happening in Kamakwe right now, because she's got all these bizarre things in there driving people away from the church. So, again, that is going to be a balance, and you know, 
Another family member, I don't see a lot of that happening in Bangladesh and for the system here. But again, that's why when the choir were there, they were singing, everybody was wearing colorful things or whatever they were doing. And I said, okay, the robe. Just cover yourself with the robe. It's a big gown. Okay, just wear your robe, cover yourself, and move away from in front of the pastors. Find that corner and just stay there and wear the robe. So for the choir, that was why we came up with the robe. Again, that if, even when we came up with the robe, it was an issue. You know, oh, why should we wear a robe? Why should we, we say we should? But, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's always a tricky situation. Even when you do try that, people complain and you don't complain. But that's why we require that many robots to was brought in as a name. You're going to wear a robe, you know. And some people protested. They, they didn't want to go in the choir anymore because of the robe. But that's fine. But that was the reason why I brought in the robe in the choir. That's strong. That is good. Thank you, sir. Yes, I think we will continue from here next um, Wednesday by the grace of God. Um, because there are so many important things we want to discuss tonight. Um, maybe I'll just ask whoever is his turn to let me just carry on. So, any other question before you round up? <laughs> Any other question? Because it's already past nine now. No question. Okay, can Pastor Mana and lead us in closing prayer? <clears throat> Let me not pray. <clears throat> thank you. Our precious and heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We give you praise and we give you all the glory. Thank you for privilege this opportunity, Lord, to study your word tonight. We ask for Lord Jehovah that in the book of James. We ask, Father, that you give us direction. We pray that you continue to speak to us. We pray the Holy Spirit will continue to direct us in the name of Jesus. That we can all join no matter what tribulations and challenges that we are going through. That we can it all joy because we know that through our trials, you know, you know that, that there is patience. And through the patience, Father, we develop our faith. And we come tonight and we ask for God to pull up for your hand upon each and every one of us. We ask for Jehovah for direction in everything that we do. We thank you for, you know, our instructor tonight. We commit them into your hands to God. But we thank you for your church from and for the church. And I pray, oh God, as we study your word, you know, you will take the words from our ears into our hearts of all. And we will not just be towards of the word, but I will go out and share your word as well. And I will give you all the praise this evening. We give you all the glory in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.